Now, this morning we are going to deliberately spend a little time in the first verse of this first chapter. And uh, we're doing that because uh, often if we move too quickly through a portion of Scripture, we fail to grasp the intention of it. And although it is not clearly demonstrated uh, in that first verse, when we begin to look into it, uh, we quickly pick up some very important and, in fact, some very vital uh, observations. And having gained this, we will then be able to fit everything that follows into the proper framework of uh, the passage. Now, I don't know if you have noted uh, this before, but the first thing that comes to our attention is that the way the Apostle Paul approaches this letter in terms of its acceptance by the people of the congregation at Philippi is unique. That is, it is different from the introduction that he has given in every other uh, letter or epistle. Now, we won't take the time to go into this this morning, but uh, let me just remind you uh, of some of the ways that the Apostle Paul has addressed the various churches. He does so with a salutation or a greeting that was quite common in his time, where, first of all, the name of the author would be given so that right from the beginning they knew from whom and from whose heart the epistle or letter was uh, written. Also, you will find that in most, not all, but in most of the opening comments of the apostle, he will give to them his official credentials. That is, he will demonstrate the authority upon which he writes his letter. And so he will often begin with the words, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. On two occasions, he will defer from that title, and he will use instead that sense of calling. And he will refer to himself as being a bond servant of Jesus Christ. But there again lies the official title and also the authority. He is writing as an apostle on the orders of the one whom he loves and serves as a bond servant. So we go through all of Paul's epistles, and you will note that that becomes the order of the day. Now, there are occasions where Paul will also comment on those who, at that particular time of writing, are, in fact, his co-workers. So, Paul will not send a letter, though it is written by himself exclusively, he will not send it out in his own name if there are others who are working with him, serving with him, in the fellowship and ministry of the gospel. And therefore, you will find that he will also draw in the name of others in that official greeting, in the initial salutation. But now we look at uh, the first letter to the Thessalonians. And uh, we could also flick across to the first letter, or the second letter to the Thessalonians, and just look at how the apostle begins with his greetings. Paul 
Silvanus, and Silvanus is just a long name for Silas. So when you read of Paul and Silas, it's Paul and Silvanus, and vice versa. So Paul simply writes, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. He does not say Paul the apostle, nor Paul the bond servant, but simply gives his name and reference. What does that suggest to us? Well, it suggests to us that Paul is not at this point exercising his authority. This is not a letter of demand. It is not a letter that is given to impress some doctrine or, uh, even for that matter, some discipline upon the church. He is simply writing as an encourager. And on that basis, he wants to draw their attention to the fact that he is writing to them as a friend. Now, that will immediately uh, bring us into a whole new dimension, and we'll begin to pick that up as uh, we go through. And just incidentally, when uh, we meet for our Bible study on Wednesday night, we're going to be uh, picking up a similar trend uh, when Paul writes to the church in Philippi, and uh, we'll be able to see there a slight variation, but yet an intense desire of Paul to appear to be uh, not just the, the comforter, not just the encourager, but the one who is to be a mentor or an example. Now, when we read these scriptures, we also need to be aware that the Word of God will always be suitable to every heart at every and any given moment. So when you read the Bible, whatever portion of Scripture that you read, you need to be aware that God is able to draw near to you and reveal himself in that Word and through that Word in a way that guarantees the need of your heart is met and, uh, and answered. Paul has included at other times uh, different members of his team. Paul is not often a single-minded <clears throat> worker. <clears throat> he will usually form a team and then bring that team with him on the exercise of his missionary journeys. And you'll see that such people as Silas and Barnabas, and uh, John Mark, and uh, Timothy, and so on, all serve their apprenticeship, as it were, under the tutorials and under the mentoring of the Apostle Paul. Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel, but these young men sit at the feet of Paul. And uh, that becomes very clear when we go to uh, any of the comments in reference to their particular ministry and, of course, to the letters that Paul wrote to young Timothy. So, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, uh, Paul is uh, simply reminding us here of his co-workers at this particular time, Silvanus, or Silas, and uh, Timothy. So, he is not only including them in way of the title, but you will note that because he has not put that little word from as a prefix to the introduction, he is also including them in the, in the actual letter itself. So, he is saying that this letter comes from him, from Silas, 
and from Timothy. Now, we have to ask, in what form and in what way? Did they all write uh, a contribution and put it all together and send it off? Or is Paul simply sharing with uh, his two co-workers what he is developing in his letter, and then after discussion with them, he is putting not only his own emotional uh, feelings into it, but also that of his co-workers. Now, it's interesting when you begin to read the first chapter of First Thessalonians, how he includes them in the letter. Just a little exercise for you to do now. Come with me to the second verse of First Thessalonians chapter 1. And notice how Paul writes, we give thanks. So the we of verse 2 relates to the Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy of verse 1. Come down to verse 5. For our gospel. Again, he's referring to his co-workers. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Again, he's referring to the visit that he shared with Silas and Timothy. And then in verse 3, For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. So Paul is saying, when we came to you as a team, ministered to you as a team, we shared in the proclamation of the gospel. In that same sense, Paul is referencing the fact that Silas and Timothy, as co-workers, play a part in the writing of this letter. But lest we jump into that dangerous territory of critical examination of the Scriptures and uh, try to minimize the integrity of of the inspiration and the revelation of the Word uh, by trying to exercise this thought of Silas and Timothy writing or contributing to the writing. Note what Paul tells us in the passage. Let's go to verse 8 of first, uh, Thess- sorry, verse 18, 1 Thessalonians Uh, chapter 2. Therefore, we wanted to come to you. Even I, Paul, time and time again, but Satan hindered us. Notice how Paul there refers to all of them, but specifically to himself. Now, into verse 5 of chapter 3. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. Chapter 5 and verse 27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. I charge you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 17. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign of in every epistle, so I write. So, even though he has included his fellow missionaries, 
he is very clearly demonstrating that this letter comes from his heart, from his pen, and expresses his concern for the congregation. Now we move a little further into the verse. <clears throat> and notice again the uniqueness of this introduction. Paul refers now to the body of believers, notably the church at Thessalonica. Now notice how Paul writes, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we were to examine this uh, further, as we will do as we're going through, you will note that, of course, the New Testament churches were all independent churches. They worked within a framework of fellowship and friendship. And they did have assembly gatherings. Uh, and uh, we see that in the book of Acts on a number of occasions where they were summoned to come together and give an account and a report of various ministries within the fellowship. But the word here that Paul uses to address this congregation would indicate their independence. <clears throat> that is their independence from other churches, but their dependence upon God. One of the unique features that we have here at Sovereign Grace Bible Church is that we are Reformed, we are independent, and we are evangelical. And it is the local congregation that guide the church under the constraints of the Bible. We are a Bible church. And uh, as such, our heart is exercised in the understanding of the Scriptures and then the confirmation as God guides us in the exercise and duty of his worship. And uh, so Paul writes to the group in Thessalonica as the church of the Thessalonians. The word church, as it's used here, uh, literally means an assembly. That's the meaning of the word. It comes from the Greek word ecclesia. And uh, being an assembly, it has to do with uh, those who have been called together for the purposes that have been set out. The word is used over 100 times in the Greek version or translation of the Old Testament. And you will see that the equivalent Hebrew word is the word congregation. And the children of Israel, as they assembled for worship at the tabernacle or the temple, were often referred to as the congregation of the Lord or of God. The word uh, represents the gathering together of like-minded people to serve a common cause or a shared interest. That is the meaning of the word. Now, in order, as we often need to do with the interpretation of Scripture, <clears throat> we need to find the setting, because the setting will give us the understanding of the meaning of the word as it is used in this particular uh, case. So let's go back to verse 1 and read. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now note again what is missing from this reference. I suggest to you that it is the word name. As we read through Scripture, we will often discover 
the call of the gospel is to be not only brought into the name, but into the fellowship of the name. And when we approach God, we do so in the name. When we pray, we do so in the name of the Lord Jesus. But look again at this verse. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God. Not in the name of God, but in God. You see, you cannot use the name if you are not already in. It is being in Christ that draws us in under the authority of the mighty name of Jesus. So, not only do we see here its interest, but we see its very origin. The church in Thessalonica is planted in God, not only in the name of God. Now, come with me in your Bible to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> and in the opening part of this chapter, we have been exercised in our understanding of what it means to be a Christian. What the Apostle Paul is about to convey to the church in Thessalonica, he has already committed to other churches to whom he has written. Upon his heart is the need for, and therefore the call, to discipline in the Christian life, living our lives in recognition of who we are, of what we are, and as a result of what we ought to be and how we ought to be in the world in which God has placed us. So here, in this third chapter of Colossians, Paul writes, If you then were raised, and immediately we think of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where the Apostle Paul clearly sets out what it means to be in Christ, raised in Christ and now dwelling in the heights of heaven as those who are in Christ. The first chapters of Colossians again identifies with that. But now read with me from verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is. Now, we could very easily put a full stop there instead of a comma. And remember that there were no punctuation marks in the early transcripts, and every comma and full stop and punctuation mark has been introduced at a later stage. So I suggest to you that when you read this verse, you read it both ways, with a comma and also with a full stop. If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Why do we need to do that? Because simply our conversation, our calling, our commitment, our walk with God is in heaven. That's where Jesus is. And so everything that motivates us as the people of God must have its anchor within the veil in heaven itself. Now, how is that exercised in our hearts and lives? Let's read again. 
If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? For you died. You cannot have a resurrection without death. For you died. And then note, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But what happens when we call upon the name of the Lord? We are placed in Christ, in God. That is where our salvation is secure. That's why Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Why? Because our lives are hidden with Christ in God. That's what it means to be a Christian. The church is in God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. It belongs to him. Come over into Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll read <clears throat> from verse 25 to 27. Husbands, Love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? So it took three times for Jesus to get the answer and response from Peter, I reckon I need to ask the question a few more times just so that you have a chance to let it sink in. But here is why this reference is so solemn and so important. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. Have you ever sat down and worked through the extent of the love of Jesus to the church? And then ask yourself, is that the kind of love that I as a husband have for my wife? That's the solemn context of the passage. Now let's read a little more. <clears throat> that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. You can't expect a positive response from your spouse if you don't love her with all your heart. Verse 27, that he might Present her to himself. She is his. He is preparing her to be presented to him as his bride. How will she appear? Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish. Here is the wonderful contrast and the difference. The older, and I'm taking a risk here, I know, I know I'm skating on thin ice at the moment, but I hope that you understand 
what I'm going to say. The older our wives, our brides are, the older they get, dare I say it, the more wrinkles and the more blemishes appear. But here is how it works with the bride of Christ. The longer we serve him, the more we grow like him. And the more we grow like him, the more the wrinkles and the blemishes disappear. And when we are at last presented before the throne of God, it will be with exceeding joy. See, that's what it means to be a Christian. God who has begun a good work in us. He will keep on working. He won't give up on us. And even if the wrinkles appear, he will come to our aid and he will so work his grace so that our lives are conformed to his very image. Remember over in Matthew chapter 16, And uh, verse 18, when poor Peter was struggling in a moment of weakness, and it appeared as though he was losing to an extent his faith. Let's go over into Matthew chapter 16. And we look at verse 18. Jesus has asked, Peter, Peter, can you tell me, who do the disciples really think and believe that I am? Tell me, who do you think that I am? And Peter answered in verse 16 and and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, Peter needed that encouragement because Peter would be told, Satan has desired to have you. But Jesus is saying to Peter here, Peter, God is working in your life. God is working in your heart. And you can tell by your response to truth. Not only are you hearing it, but you're perceiving it. You're understanding it. You are agreeing with it. And to make this comment indicates that this hasn't come from within. It's come from above. This is the wisdom that James writes about. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. It's a good thing to go to college and university and gain all the knowledge that we can. But if it was a matter of spiritual knowledge and earthly knowledge, then we need to focus all our energy on the knowledge that comes from above. Because very soon this life will end. And where will the knowledge of the world take us at the end of the day? We need to be equipped with that knowledge that comes from above. Now here is how it applies in Peter's life. Verse 18, And I also say to you, what a comforting thought. I also say to you, Peter, my Father in heaven is talking to you. He is revealing the word to you. And I also say to you. And here is what we read. You are Peter. And on this rock, I 
will build my church. Now, some have taken this reference to mean that on being given the keys of the kingdom, Peter became the first pope, and as a result was then able to discharge his responsibility by telling the church what it should believe and shouldn't believe, what it should do and shouldn't it do. But that text, upon which other doctrines have been established and uh, proclaimed, has been taken grossly out of context and its subsequent teaching bears no resemblance whatsoever to what this Bible text actually means. Two words are used specifically in the verse. One is the name Peter. The name Peter means a stone. That is a small stone pebble that you would pick up off a stony beach. The other is the word rock, and the word there literally means a plateau of rock, or if you like, a mountain range. So we're speaking about two different things. If you and I were hiding behind a wall and trying to listen in to this conversation, we could quite easily get it wrong. But if we were to be present and observe, the way this verse is given indicates a movement in the verse, not only in going from a stone to a plateau, but also in the way that the conversation is handled. I could say to you today, not to all of you, but to uh, at least one I could say, you are Peter. You notice what I'm doing. You are Peter. If I pointed at you, you would say, no, I'm not Peter, I'm John, I'm Jack, I'm Mary. No, no, that's not me. But Jesus said, you are Peter. He was speaking directly to Peter. So what does he want Peter to do? He wants Peter to take note. So now Jesus says, you are Peter. Are you watching? Are you listening? Are you observing? Are you learning? Peter, you are the stone, but I am the rock. And Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. So Jesus is not saying to Peter, I'm going to build the church on you, Peter. Peter is having this instruction. Jesus said, Peter, you are going to help build the church on me. On this rock, I will build my church. So the church, in that sense, not of the ecclesiastical church. The church ecclesiastical can be built on falsehood. And there are many churches, sadly, And that is the case. They're not built on truth. They're not built on the Scriptures. They're not built on uh, doctrine anchored in the Word of God. But the church, His church, is the church that He has declared He will build, and the very gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Now, just for that little moment, put this together. Where is the church? It is in the Father and the Son. What about the members of that church? Every one of them are in the Father and the Son. So, as Peter now begins this epistle, he wants them to know their privileged position. 
He wants them to know that even though they had to flee from the city for fear of persecution and possible imprisonment and death, that even though they are in the midst of these trials and tribulations, they are the church. And nothing will prevail against it. Because it is his church. And they are his people. One final thought as uh, we conclude. Look at the greeting. Look at the greeting. Back in First Thessalonians chapter 1. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace go hand in hand. Peace is the result of grace. And as Paul writes this letter to the church in, the, in Thessalonica, you and I this morning can embrace these truths because we are the people of God. If we have given our lives over fully, freely, totally, committed our lives to Jesus, accepting by faith that he gave his life upon the cross, he died for sinners. And if we recognize that we are sinful, that we cannot save ourselves, it's not by works lest anyone should boast, but rather we are saved by God's grace through faith. It is not of ourselves. And if we, by strong conviction, reach that conclusion, the answer to our need can only be found at Calvary, where Jesus died for us, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And if this morning you do not know him as your Savior and as your Lord, this morning he reaches out to you through his word and by his spirit, saying to your heart, Come unto me, all you that labor under heavy laden, and I will, I will give you rest. The one who has said, I will build my church, now says to you, I will give you rest. Will you come? Let's pray. <clears throat> Our loving Father, we continue <clears throat> in your presence here today and we thank you for your word. We thank you that we are not dependent upon our own thoughts or feelings or motivation in order to recognize that you are dealing with us. You are a God of mercy, of pardon, of assurance, of patience, of love, and of grace. And we pray that as we have reflected upon the amazing concepts of your grace, that we will be overwhelmed with that sense of our own unworthiness, our own sinfulness, so that we may flee from the wrath to come and find peace and assurance and salvation in the Lord. Jesus Christ. Grant that as we dwell and abide in him, his word will abide in us so that our relationship 
will be seen and known by all who observe our lives in these wicked days. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen.